Sporting Journal Radio, presented by Onyx. Well, our region here in the United States is rich with natural resources. If you like to hunt and fish, there's, it's probably why you live here. Um, m- maybe not, but you should enjoy the natural resources we have here if you do live here. Uh, and in Minnesota, we have a lot of opportunities that a lot of the other uh hunters and anglers around the United States don't have. I've traveled a lot across the U.S. up into Canada. I've traveled down to South America uh, chasing chasing birds and animals and fish around. And it's pretty interesting when you talk to people from other parts of the, of the world, really, and you tell them all the opportunities that we have here in Minnesota. We're, we're really fortunate, and a lot of us take it for granted. So it's important to make sure that we manage those resources properly and I know our DNR gets a lot of criticism in Minnesota. Sometimes it's rightfully so. Sometimes it's people, I think, that just like to complain. But the future of the DNR is something that we all need to keep an eye on. And the way the DNR is managed, the way the DNR is run, the way it's funded is an important topic. And recently, uh, there was a press release that came out that said a new funding structure, new funding mechanisms. I, I can't remember how they worded it exactly, but the DNR wants to find some new ways to fund things. Uh, well, Henry Drews is now a retired uh, fisheries manager from Northwest Minnesota, and he joins us here on the show. Henry, how you doing? Uh yeah, thanks for coming on. You wrote a letter uh, that appeared in Outdoor News. You wrote an article for Outdoor News, and and that was forwarded to me. I went around to a bunch of people. I had it sent to me from a number of different people that talked about uh, some potential issues with this new f- funding proposal or whatever you want to call it that the DNR is coming out with. Um, so I, I, I want to get your opinion opinions on it, what you think might be coming down the line, what your concerns are and uh, whether or not we should be worried about it. But first, let's just, let's just get a little bit of background. You worked for the DNR for, for, what, 35 years or so? Is that right? And what did you do? I was a regional fisheries manager for the past 23 years, and I held other positions prior to that. But for the last 23 years, I've been the regional manager in the northwest part of the state, responsible for all the fisheries operations, um, basically the whole northwest quarter, from the Manitoba border down the Dakota border, you know, down to Alexandria and including, you know, significant waters like Leech Lake, Upper Red, Lake of the Woods and Cass Lake. So it's uh, it's been a great ride. I had a wonderful time, tremendous staff and some real resource challenges. And uh, it's just been fantastic. That northwest part of Minnesota is is so unique because it's you're, it, it's kind of that prairie country. You're starting into the, get into northern Minnesota. It almost feels like you're in Canada when you're in you know, like prairie Canada when you're in parts of it. You got moose, wolves, and bear running around in prairie type landscapes. And I don't I, I you know I've got some friends that live up there, and I go up there and I always talk to them about how I feel like there's no water around here. So there's you guys don't have any lakes up here. I always. It, it, I don't think of there being a lot of lakes up there, but in your Northwest region, you had some of the m- biggest lakes in the state, some of the more major lakes that we have, Lake of the Woods, uh, Red Lake, uh, um, Leech Lake, Leech Lake, no, Leech Lake, Leech Lake, and Cass. Oh yeah, and probably the Red River then too, I suppose. Yeah, it includes the Red River and also the Rainy River, so We've got everything on the fish end from muskies to sturgeon to, you know, the, the best channel catfish river in North America and brook trout streams and brown trout streams, some of the best walleye fishing in the whole state. And, and the pan fishing is just unbelievable. So, um, yeah, it's quite the resource. And like you said, um, if you're an outdoors person, whether you just hunt or just fish or do both like myself and you do, it's nirvana to be able to live up here. It's been a, and a true privilege to, to work and, and have a hand in the managing the sport fisheries up here. Well, I tell you what, like I, you know, you talk to the Mille Lacs guys and you, you feel sorry for them sometimes for what they're dealing with over there. But, but you've obviously dealt with similar type situations. And then when you talk about having to deal with a, a river like the Red River and go through the flooding situations that you had to deal with there, when you talk about uh, the Rainy River and the sturgeon recovery up there and just managing walleye populations on Lake of the Woods and then the the red the, the red lake situation you probably deserve a medal for for going through uh what you went through on red lake up there describe uh just briefly describe how how that situation went for you well you know in the, in the mid 90s the uh red lake walleye population crashed there was essentially not enough um 
reprodu reproducing fish left in that population to sustain itself, to recover itself. So together, the DNR and the uh, Red Lake Band of Chippewa worked together to develop a recovery plan. And that recovery plan included a complete harvest moratorium for um, a period of time, and then an aggressive short-term stocking program and rigorous enforcement. And uh, just seven years into it, we were able to reopen that fishery. And, and since that time, we've been able to manage that fishery as an absolute gem. And I can't say enough for the partnership that we've developed with the Red Lake Band. Uh, we have been hand in glove with the tribe on all steps of management of that fishery since it reopened. And I think the future of Red Lake is extremely promising. So seven years is pretty remarkable. When you came up with the plan to, to, to close fishing, to, to start that plan of recovery, what was, the pers what was the reception you got from the fishing public here in Minnesota? Well, you know, at that time, in, um, you know, the band closed their fishery completely in 1998 and the state closed the state waters in 1999. We signed the, the agreement with the tribe to recover that fishery in, in uh, April of 1999. And we weren't sure how long it would need to be closed. We consulted with the public, um, the businesses. There weren't very many businesses left in the Was Washkish area. And we sat down with them and talked about we can either use a um, semi-aggressive approach. It might take longer. It may not work. Or we can go for the aggressive approach. And that would be a complete harvest closure. And so so we, we were able to work with the uh, remaining businesses and other constituents to uh, go for it with the most aggressive approach, and um, and we were we were successful. Um, the fishery responded to the three stockings we did in 1999, 2001, and 2003 better than we could have anticipated, and we were able to see that that recovery advance, you know, at a rather rapid rate. We started working on a harvest management plan in 2005, and then also what an opener would look like. And so in 2006, at midnight on uh, the fishing opener, you know, history was made and we reopened that resource after seven years. And, and I think the, the rest is, as they say, history. What? And I, uh, it, it, I certainly had a role in it, but I, I must mention that, you know, it was a team effort all along, a, a large team of, of DNR employees. And of course, the natural resources staff from the Red Lake Band. No one person would deserve a medal, you know, as you might have suggested. <laughs> yeah, sure, um, of course. It was, a, it was an absolute teamwork. And uh, I, again, I can't say enough for how great it's been working with the Red Lake Band. What do you think caused that situation? And what what is going to be, what, what was put in place to make sure that doesn't happen again? Well, we, we have a harvest plan. What caused it was over harvest. And that was over harvest uh, by both tribal and state um, users. And when we embarked on the recovery, it was really important that we decided that we were not going to uh, focus our energy on fixing blame. We were going to focus our energy on fixing the problem. And so, so that's, that's where we put all of our energies. Um, the safeguards of moving forward to prevent that from occurring again is a, a well-crafted uh, management plan, a framework to determine how and when we need to adjust harvest and then um, implementing that um, and rigorous enforcement by both jurisdictions. So when you look at what you went through with Red Lake and you look at what's going on with Mille Lacs uh, now and, and obviously for the past few years, what similarities do you see between the two? Well, you know, I, the similarities are that um, multiple jurisdictions need to work together. Um, and that's, that's the only real similarity. Um, Upper Red Lake, Lower Red Lake are far different systems than Mille Lacs. Um, ecologically, they're, they're quite different. The Red Lakes have a very simple fish community. The fish community in Mille Lacs is much more diverse. Um, the intensity of use on Mille Lacs and the potential being so close to the metro area yeah. is different than what we see on Red Lake. And so the challenge of regulating a limited harvest on Mille Lacs is, is much more complex than on Red. Um, the similarities are that people love walleye and they love to keep walleye and um, you know it's the management challenges how to allocate that resource with red lake we have two entities we work on allocation with that's the red lake band and the state of minnesota on Mille Lacs, the fisheries managers are not only working with the Mille Lacs band but they're working with the wisconsin bands and um, 
and it's it's way more complex because there's more players in the system. There's also the effect of invasive species that we mm -hmm. have on Malax and we don't have on red to this date. Zebra mussels are present on red, but they've not yet uh, expanded to have an impact on the fish community. So um, they're they're vastly different. There are some similarities. Um, and the challenges are unique, I think, to each lake. You, you can't just draw conclusions from one lake and apply it to the other. If only you could just uh, shoot some cormorants and fix the problem. <laughs> no? Well, well, you know, if, if cormorants were the problem on the lax, right, that'd right. be an easy solution. Right. Well, that's an amazing story about leech, though, and, and how, I mean, that's really what, what brought the walleyes back, right? Bringing some shoot, sharpshooters out there? Well, you know, that was again. We we started that effort in the in the mid two thousands, and things weren't going real well on leech. And and you know, I'll admit that that we did not in the in the early two thousands think that cormorants could could be you know as as large a villain as they turned out to be. There was no published literature anywhere in the United States that uh, a burgeoning cormorant population could affect sport fish to the level that that we were able to document. Once we had the documentation in place, we, we worked with, the again, the Leech Lake Band, and as they own the islands where the birds are uh, mm -hmm. roosting, and we worked with them and got approval from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to control the cormorants. Um, again, it was a partnership. It was uh, the state of Minnesota and the Leech Lake Band in this case, and, uh, and the feds, you know, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So we were able to implement a tool in that situation that was, has proven to be very effective. We also had a short-term stocking program there that um, for a couple of years it, it contributed. Um, and then and then we used regulations in an adaptive way um, for an initial time to protect the remaining brood stock. And then we relax those regulations as we move forward as a fish population, you know, told us that we could harvest more fish. So we've, we've continually adjusted regulations on red and leech to match the uh, pressures that those fisheries are under. Most hated bird in the world. That's, <laughs> I think, pretty accurate. I, 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 do you know about that cormorant season? Was it Ontario started a cormorant season? Is that where it was? You can hunt yeah, them up, I, them up I, there. Yeah, I did hear that. I, I guess I I, I wonder how much participation they actually yeah, had, you know, um, who knows, you know, in Minnesota, we have a wanton waste law that you have to utilize anything Correct. you shoot or anything you catch and harvest. And I don't know exactly how that played out in Ontario, but, um, while there might've been some fun involved in that, I, I, I'm not, sure. yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I want to grill up any cormorant anytime soon. I want to ask you about one more of the big lakes that, that you were a part of up there and that's Lake of the Woods. And obviously there's some, there's been some changes when it comes to limits the last couple of years. And there's some concern about the amount of angling hours on that lake, particularly in, in the winter. Um, do you foresee more limits coming, uh, more uh, restrictive limits coming to that lake? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to defer that to the, the folks that are managing that lake now up on the border. You know, that's uh, Phil Talmadge is the area supervisor and he's outstanding. Um, up to up until the time I retired, um, all of the data we had suggested, you know, one, that winter pressure is growing. The last two years have been record high. However, the harvest hasn't been record high. You know, it, it mm -hmm. kind of um, was self-regulating from a standpoint. The more peop you, uh, people you have up there, they have to share the pie and individual slice of the pie is smaller. Um, but we have a rigorous monitoring program up there. We survey that like every year, um, a real robust gill netting program. Um, program and we we have the data we we take all the biological parameters we need to keep our pulse on that population kind of like when you go in and get a physical whether it's a blood test and and they look at all the micronutrients in your blood and your iron level and your take your pulse and your blood pressure we're doing that on lake of the woods every year and at this point in time, there is no cause for an alarm, no need for an abrupt regulation change. Mm -hmm. um, I think you're showing the viewers our management plan up there. We have a citizens input group that we work with. We meet with them every year. We go through the annual monitoring data. And I think we have the data that will help us tell when we need to pull the trigger on different regulations. And as of uh, my point of retirement, you know, a month ago, we were not at that juncture. Um, uh, to need to make more regulation changes up there. Certainly, we're going to continue with the creel surveys in the winter, and, and uh, periodically in the summer, we're going to track harvest, and we're going to continue to do our annual monitoring. 
but I do not see an abrupt course correction at this time. The, the biological data just does not suggest that's necessary. I wanted to ask you about all these lakes and uh, a because I'm interested in your opinion on them and they're they're very important to anglers in in the region, not just Minnesota, but in the region or really from all over the country that that travel to fish these these walleye factories. But I also wanted our, our listeners and our viewers to who may not be familiar with with your you know your history, your work, and who you are, uh, just to get a little background so they know where you're coming from when it when it comes to your opinions on what's going on with the DNR and where we're headed in the future. So you've probably known about this before all of us because you obviously were working with the DNR, so you probably heard that there was going to be some talk of restructuring uh, before we saw the press release about it. Where do you think that's coming from, and um, do you think we need to change things up? Well, Brett, there's two there's two different things that that you're um, you're talking about here. There's one. There's a, a division of Fish and Wildlife is looking at restructuring. That's issue number one. The second issue is a broad based um, looking at funding options for the long term for the agency. Um, the former is what I'll focus on. The latter is a is a I think it's a great idea. The agency needs to look at broad based funding opportunities for all the divisions, whether it's for public water access, whether it's for state parks or fish and wildlife management. So they are two distinct entities. The funding um, uh, challenge and the funding ideas that are going to be talked about over the coming years, I think, is fantastic. And I and kudos to Sarah Stroman for initiating a conversation about longer term funding for the agency and for all the divisions. The first um, issue, though, is the, the restructuring or reorganization. That is um, specific to the Division of Fish and Wildlife, and it's a project that was initiated approximately two years ago. Um, so, so that, I think, is what we should focus our conversation on. Okay. All right. What was, uh, what was, what was the plan, or what are they talking about doing? Well, like I said, the conversation started in the middle of 2019 about how we best uh, organize or structure the division of fish and wildlife. I and a number of my colleagues, some that are still working and some that have since retired like myself, expressed concern in, in 2019. Um, in the early part of this process, some of the ideas they were talking about you know, didn't make sense. We did not think they were good ideas. And, when, and those ideas would include merging the, the regional fisheries manager and regional wildlife manager positions in each of the regions, merging the research manager positions for fisheries and wildlife, uh, merging the operations manager positions for both fish and wildlife, and possibly even including merging the chief of fisheries and chief of wildlife positions. Hmm. So, so we, uh, in 2019 and then early 2020, um, a number of us managers put our concerns in writing and shared those with the division director and those involved in the uh, reorganization discussion. And, and those were that, that one, um, you don't embark on a discussion about reorganization until you identify the problem it is that you're trying to fix. And, and that still, to this date, to my knowledge, has not been clearly defined. So it has been, since its inception, uh, searching for a solution in the absence of identified problem. And, and that's the concerns. And um, the other concern I have is that, that there were, at no point in the process was there any discussion about the need to include the public and our angling and hunting publics in this discussion. It wasn't until after um, I retired and wrote a commentary in Outdoor News and John Williams, my colleague from wildlife in the region, um, made some comments in his retirement interviews. Did, did we at all hear anything about a public process to um, get input from the public? And the question is, why is this important? Why is it important to anglers? One, you know, the fisheries profession and the wildlife profession, while there are commonalities, they are distinctly different. When we go to college, we get trained different. We take different classes. We have areas of expertise and specialization. And I believe that, that the angling, anglers and the hunters in the state want that speci specialization all the way up to the managerial positions because we deal with the issues. Um, our previous uh, dialogue here on this interview, we talked about managing Red Lake, Leech Lake, Lake of the Woods. I was personally involved as a regional fisheries manager in each of those, as were the staff that I supervised. The public that we work with on our input groups got to hear 
specifically and directly from me as the manager in Northwest Minnesota, fisheries trained, fisheries experience. If they merged my position, for example, with the regional wildlife position, manager position, it's quite possible that the person they would speak to when an issue emerges or a challenge emerges would be somebody trained in wildlife. Conversely, it could be if it was a regional fisheries person that became the manager for both fish and wildlife in, in the Northwest region, then I would be dealing with CWD response in Beltrami County right now. Oh boy. Oh boy. It's, it's simply not a good idea to, to meld and merge the managerial positions in the division of fish and wildlife. Not only does it, will it have an impact on the delivery of conservation programs, it starts to blur the lines of budget between the two units. And I think that that's something that's uh, arguably extremely important to both our anglers and our hunters, to have those, those discrete budgets and be able to be accountable to our anglers and our hunters on the use of those budgets. Do you think the idea was just a, a staffing question or a budget question of, of having to pay two people for that position just to save some money, just pay one to do it? I think that's part of the concept. The, the the justification for this has been one, there's a bunch of vacancies. Two, we need to look at efficiencies. Well, I think if you looked at what a, a regional wildlife manager does and look at what the regional fisheries manager does in one location, there are no economies of scale. We're clearly both fully employed. There's enough issues in all of the regions for, um, and I'm just speaking of the regional manager jobs, there's enough issues to keep us fully employed and keep on top of issues as they're emerging. That the idea of combining that those two positions into a single position means the people planning to do that don't really have a very good understanding of the jobs. Right. So, I mean, obviously you want people that are in charge of some of these regions and in charge of biologists in the field to know what they're talking about when they're out there talking to people. And I guess the bigger picture, and this comes into that when you start talking about funding as well, why are we underfunded? Like, I, I know there's talk of decreasing participation in, in the outdoors, and I, I feel like we've reversed that trend in a big way the last couple of years. So is, is the overall picture still bleak? Are they worried that that participation is going to drop off sharply after after the, this pandemic situation that we're, we're in? Or are there some other efficiencies? You know, are we funding programs that maybe aren't as, you know, maybe aren't as necessary? I mean, obviously fisheries and wildlife have to be number one and number two priorities or number one and number one priorities, maybe however you want to look at it. But w where are the inefficiencies? You know, I think the long-term funding considerations are real. The, the trajectory, if you look nationally, and license sales for both hunting and fishing across the country are down. Um, the, the Minnesota is bucking that tradition or that observation on a national scale. Our fishing license sales in Minnesota are very strong, and they've been very stable. Hunting license sales in Minnesota, though, are on a different trajectory. They're heading downwards, the last two years being an aberration. So there are concerns. Are we doing the work we do the most efficient way we can? Those are fantastic questions, yeah. and those are those are things we should always be looking at, and I think we do do a pretty good job of that. But to jump immediately into reorganization, I think is premature. Let me, oh, go ahead. Well, I let me ask you this question: um, When it comes to license sales and this decline, we're and I and. I should have done more research before I asked this question, but when you look back at the history of the DNR and the history of license sales, I mean, I mean, really, what we what do we have? Seventy five years of history, uh, approximately. Where, where? I mean, did we did we have an unnatural peak in there? Are we coming back down to where we probably should be, or do you think do you think it's uh, do you think it's an unreal expectation to stay as high as we were? Uh, when we don't really have that much history to, to judge a, a trend in the license sales. Right. You know, and, and I'm not an expert in this, this area, um, whether it be marketing or whether it be, you know, the data mining from license sales. But what I, what I do know is that the, the strongest period of our license sales occurred, you know, and lasted from post-World War II, you know, through the baby boom generation. And a lot of the baby boomers aren't timing out. Yeah. I'm on the latter part of that curve. Um, the baby boomers, you know, are, are 
are the largest buyers of licenses, you know, particularly, you know, in the hunting and, and they're starting to phase out and there aren't enough younger hunters and anglers coming in into being recruited to replace them. So the, the tables, you know, you look at the, not a, it's not a longevity table, but the actuary kind of tables of, of participation, you got to need as many replacements to come in to replace those that are timing out. And that's not happening. It's more acute with, with uh, hunting license sales than it is with fishing license sales. Sure, sure. It's just that much more difficult to get young people involved in hunting because you, you need to mentor them. It's a lot more difficult to mentor hunting than it is angling. Yeah, there's, there's so so the declines are real, and the seventy-five year time period is enough to give us a cause for concern, given the, the trajectory that we see. Well, there there's definitely some barriers, some more barriers uh, of entry for for hunting out there. Um, but you know, when we went dove hunting here this week on opener, every single piece of state land had hunters all over it. So I don't always see the decline when I'm out there in the field trying to find a place to hunt and, and, you know, land access and places to go obviously is one of those barriers for everybody. And then, and I know for a fact, some people have quit hunting because sometimes it's hard to find land to get on. You can't, you don't have the, you know, everybody and their neighbors used to hunt everybody and their neighbor's property back in the day. And you just don't have that anymore because people People are managing for deer, planting food plots, or whatever the case may be. So uh, I, I think it's an interesting discussion why there might be a, a decline out there. Uh, whatever the reason, obviously we need to continue to find ways to fund because it's a it's like a user fee essentially to pay for that management. But do you you know maybe this isn't a question for you necessarily, but I've always been a proponent. Uh, since our natural resources are as important as they are for us in this state economically, the amount of money uh, generated from hunting and fishing in Minnesota is uh, in the billions. Should more money from the general fund go to managing our resources and less about user fees? Uh, could that be one of the ways to solve a funding issue? I absolutely. And I think that's going to be in the mix with this new group that Sarah Stroman has asked mm -hmm. to look at options. Good. And I, I think that's a that's very good. We used to get, you know, 25, 30 years ago, a fair bit of, of general fund money. And, and I know, for example, a lot of that was used to pay for conservation officer salaries, mm -hmm. you know, and so there are a lot of ideas that, that should be explored. And, and I and again, kudos to Commissioner Stroman for for putting a group together to, to see what options are out there. Uh, from my perspective, um, you know, the, the, the people that buy hunting and fishing licenses don't just pay for those management programs. Uh, as a fisheries manager, we're doing environmental review. We're issuing permits to protect habitat, you know, from aquatic plant management destruction. There's a lot of things that we do in fish and wildlife that are to the benefit for water quality oh, yeah, and yeah. for recreation that, you know, may not, that may be benefiting people that don't buy licenses. So it's a logical reach to, to think that a broader uh, segment of our, of our population should be contributing to, to our natural resource management programs. No, oh, I 100 percent agree with that. I know they've tried to tax some of that equipment and uh, the, you know bird watchers, hikers, whatever it is, a, 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 you know like a Pittman Robertson or something like that. And it hasn't really gone over very well. So getting people to pay to go walk a WMA, you know, or or bird watch or whatever the case may be, I think it's going to be a bit of a struggle out there. I'm all for getting some of those people to pay their fair share if they're going to utilize those resources. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know how well that would go over. Um, but yeah, I think it should be, it should be fair for everybody if you're going to be using it. You know, I, I think the key anytime, like when we go out and ask for a hunting and fishing license fee increase, the key is to be honest and explain exactly what the need is and how it'll be used. You know, we passed the um, the Outdoor Heritage Act in Minnesota on, on during a time when we were in real budget straits. It was not a good time for the economy and, and no one thought it could pass, but it did. It passed because the need was identified, the uses were clearly uh, delineated, and the public responded. So I think anytime you ask more people to help pay for something, I think it's a matter of being uh, straightforward and honest on what the needs are and how you're going to use it, and then be accountable for how you use it. Well, I just, 
I, I just want to make sure, I guess my biggest concern with, uh, you know, some sort of big type of restructuring or funding, new funding mechanisms, essentially, is that things just, I don't want to say things stay the same, uh, because that won't, that won't sound right, but I, I don't want major changes to the outdoor opportunities that I enjoy, the hunting and fishing opportunities, because they're they're pretty unique to us here in Minnesota. I mean, yeah, some states have maybe better this or better that, but for overall, for a variety of hunting and angling opportunities in Minnesota, we're pretty fortunate with what we have for resources. And I don't want my, I don't want my opportunities diminished when it comes to where I can fish, where I can hunt, things like that. And I know nobody's talking about that, but anytime you start to discuss changing something or other or including this or that or doing this now all of a sudden we have to listen to what they want to do and maybe all of a sudden these bird watchers or these hikers want this wma because there's a rare you know shorebird or something on there that all of a sudden now hunting's going to be restricted there uh i understand everybody has a right to public property i'm not trying to diminish that that uh that fact at all, but I, I want to make sure that some of those opportunities, uh, because you restrict that and you're going to lose more hunters again, as it goes. So I'll, that's one of my biggest concerns. So let's get away from the funding again. Cause I know, uh, Utah, your big con- biggest concerns were with the merging of these departments. So what do you think, what do you foresee happening? When do you think these changes could happen? And let's talk solutions. What do you think the department should do? Well, you know, the timeline that I understand is that um, the discussions are going on internally right now in October, and there's a commitment to get some public input between October and the first of the year. And it's my understanding that the division director, Dave Olfelt, would like to make these changes if there are any, you know, by the first of the year. Hmm, quickly. So that's my understanding of the timeline. Um, you know, my crystal ball, where do I see it going? I, I think once you... Um, once you start an, an endeavor like this, you're not going to come to a conclusion that nothing should be changed. I think there's going to be some changes. Um, I hope that there, there are changes that are smart, that are based on a, a, a clearly defined objectives, and I hope it's not change for the sake of change. Yeah. I, I hope that um, we keep in mind that for a strong division of fish and wildlife, it's, it's an analogy like a football team. You, you have a, a good football team, has a strong offense, and has a strong defense. You have people that are specialized on offense, like a middle linebacker. You have, you have uh, or defense. You have a specialization in a fullback or a running back. You don't combine those positions and say, we're going to be more efficient and combine the middle linebacker with the running back. You don't do that. Same in the division of fish and wildlife. You don't combine managers because you think one manager can do both. I think the anglers and the hunters in this state expect to have professionally trained people at all of the managerial positions up to the division director level. Mm -hmm. I hope they look around and look at South Dakota, North Dakota, Iowa, and Wisconsin, our adjacent states, and see that they've retained a, a system where the wildlife line of authority and the fisheries lines of authority are discrete and separate up to the division director level. There's a reason all the other states are, are maintaining a bifurcated structure up to the division director. And it's a reason why Minnesota has done that. It works. And so to start monkeying with something so fundamental to the delivery of conservation programs, I think is a grave mistake. Well, we have some great biologists in the state and, and they went to school for this. They have a passion for it. They specialize, as you mentioned, in their areas, and we need to make sure that they can do their job uh, the best way possible in those areas as well. We need we need uh, to have leadership in the agency that supports the delivery of programs at the area office level and the regional office level, whether it's the fisheries research unit, the habitat unit, or whether it's the management or hatchery staff. We need to have clear lines of, of professionally trained individuals um, from the field all the way up to the managerial levels and, ha- and seek to hire the very best people to do those jobs that are professionally trained to do that specific type of work. I think that's what all the professionals in the state of Minnesota want. I think that's why they got into it in the first place. Uh, many of us started angling and hunting as, as small kids. Mm-hmm. And we pursued it as a profession, and we want to continue to do that. And we're all very, very dedicated to the delivery of uh, fish and wildlife programs to the hunters and anglers. 
because we do that ourselves. We are all hunters and anglers, and it's it's ingrained in us to do our best job. Yeah, absolutely. And we need to make sure that we can fund those those positions, of course, and full-time positions year-round, 12 months out of the year to do their jobs uh, uh, where they need to do them and, and do the jobs right. Uh, what, what, we had some vacancies in some of those r- regional offices, correct? And that was partly why this discussion came up at this time? Yes, that's a fact um, that they're holding all those vacancies in the managerial positions, Um until they reach decisions. Some of those manager vacancies were actually in place uh, prior to the pandemic as early as 2019. So so somebody's had some ideas about where this is heading that long ago. This is not some new idea. Um, I'll tell you, there's a cost to holding so many field positions and manager positions vacant and have people in acting positions. It's burning people out, morale is down, and there's concern um, over why those positions are being held and why they're not being being filled. And that's creating some of the consternation about, you know, what is the outcome of this going to be? Why aren't they being filled? They're not being filled because they want to meet, um, leadership wants to maintain their options, whether they want to combine positions or not. They want to keep those positions there, the uh, those options available for them. Hmm. Interesting. Well, we, that, that in that in itself raises some of the suspicion of what the intentions are. Hmm. Well, we could probably talk about how the DNR sh- should be run for hours and maybe days, and and uh, have all sorts of opinions on it. But it's a pretty in, well, pretty, I, pretty important discussion. Well, Brett, you know, don't get me wrong here. I have great pride in the organization. Sure. I, uh, in the Division of Fish and Wildlife uh, had a wonderful career. There's there's a large number of incredibly talented people in, in the Division of Fish and Wildlife. And, and it'd be really nice uh, for them to be able to focus on doing their jobs, making habitat better, stocking fish, um, doing surveys. Um, they'd sure rather be focusing on that than worrying about whether or not they're going to be reporting to somebody that's not trained in their discipline. Mm -hmm. It'd be nice to get this off the table and move forward. Well, I know it's been a a tough couple of years just in itself going through the pandemic. And I know a lot of, uh, you know, I know a lot of people were, were stuck indoors when they should have been outside working in my personal opinion. I mean, outside away from the people out in out in the middle of nowhere it seems like the perfect place to be in it during a pandemic in my opinion but that's just my opinion um but yeah we need we need people to be out there doing their job and doing it right and not having to worry about um worrying about things that don't really matter to them very much so all right well i I, I hope things work out the way you want them to work out because I, I agree. I think that's a, an important way to, for us to go and for things to move forward. But I appreciate you coming on here and telling us uh, your concerns and your opinions and, and also your thoughts. I agree that uh, some, some of the people in the DNR, some, I, I think the DNR has done a good job in a lot of ways overall, but there's, you know, you're not going to win them all. So there's always going to be some positives and negatives here and there. And everybody's going to, I, you know, I feel for you guys who have to make some of these decisions because I guarantee you that you've gotten some emails that are probably not as positive at times throughout your career. And that's, that's tough to have to deal with. Well, you know, when you're a public servant, that's just part of the job, Brett. And, and, you know, the key is, is, you know, you, you may not like to hear some of that stuff, but ultimately at the end of the day, when you, when you listen to your critics as, as, closely as you listen to your supporters, yeah. you're going to make better decisions. Um, that's just a fact. And that's the life of a public servant. And, and we take that pretty seriously. Yeah. And, you know, it's nice to see that there's people passionate about our outdoors here. Yeah, I know you were you were busy. I wanted to have you on the show last week, but you were out there taking advantage of a pretty unique outdoor opportunity here in Minnesota. You were harvesting wild rice. Yes, my wife got me into harvesting wild rice about 10 years ago. You can see in the, the background there, let me see, there, you know, a there canoe full of rice. Um, that was one of the tribal members she worked with on her Ph.D. But um, wild ricing in the fall uh, is now a big part of our life. Um, we spend a couple of weeks every fall out harvesting rice. She's taught me how to do it and got me out in the boat with her. And um, we really, really enjoy it. To me, it's the kickoff of the fall season. It's the transition from fishing to the fall gathering. And you start with the wild rice, and next is sharp tail grass, grouse mm-hmm. on the North Dakota prairie, and ducks in South Dakota. And then, then, then the deer season rolls around, and then there's pheasants. And it's just an amazing time of the year. And wild rice harvest um, 
kicks it off. And, and we, we gift a lot of rice. I give it to landowners where I hunt. And uh, it's just a special time to be out there you know, with, the, with the young wood ducks and the, mm-hmm. and the teal and the sort of rails and, and everything else that's out there. Great time. Best time of the year. You know, and as a fisheries guy, you should mention that fishing is pretty good this time of year too, but it's all, it's always a struggle. And I tend to always just bring the shotgun and leave the fishing rod at home. But, uh, those fishing opportunities are pretty good. You know, Brett, that's been my, uh, my angle here for the last uh, 15 years. And, um, but now that I have a little more time on my hands, I'm not going (laughs) to winterize my boat on Labor Day weekend anymore. And speaking of angles, that canoe paddle that you got what is that bending branches is that what those were called is that what you got yeah that's yeah. correct and technically to be be fair that's my wife's special paddle i'm not allowed to use it <laughs> well i have a couple of those we we grew up with those in the on our boundary waters trips using those paddles all the time so yeah i actually actually bought a couple of my my uh, younger daughter and i did a couple of triathlons with canoeing and we bought some uh, wow. some some graphite bent mm. pat, shaft paddles once you use one of those, you'll never use a wooden paddle again. <laughs> I bet. I bet. I had some sore some sore arms and shoulders and uh, lots of blisters on those trips, of course, yeah. up there. You know, you know, we were talking about wild rice. This year's been particularly tough with the low water. Oh, sure. Um, sure. Yeah, about half of the, the rivers and lakes we normally harvest, we can't even put a boat in. So mm-hmm. it's been tough on the harvesters. It's going to be tough on duck hunters. Mm-hmm putting boats out on some of those waters so for sure um, but every year is different just like uh, whether it's bow hunting or, or duck hunting you got to scout and if you scout for wild rice you'll find some places to get scouting it. is the number one piece of advice i give anybody when they ask me about you know hunting pheasants ducks geese whatever scouting is always number one got to find well it, you, it. it's as important to put the time in on that as it is to to take the time off to go yeah for sure I always you know, people don't give themselves enough time. A lot of times they take, they, you know, they just go on the weekend or whatever. They don't give themselves time to scout and you give yourself an extra day. And your, uh, your experience is going to be that much better. All right, Henry Drews, uh, good luck with everything. And thanks. Thanks for the time today on the show. Absolute Brett. It's been a pleasure joining you. Enjoy your retirement. Thank you. Hear more at sporting or wherever you get podcasts. The best deals of the year on fall hunting gear are coming. The Woods Fall Outdoor Expo is back at the Woods and War Road, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, September 9th, 10th, and 11th. And this year, the world's largest novice goose calling contest takes place Saturday, September 11th with over $10,000 in prizes. North American goose calling champion Coy Loftler will be giving seminars starting at noon with the contest kicking off at 2. The Woods Outdoor Expo is back September 9th through the 11th at the Woods and War Road. Learn more at thewoodsgoods.com.